Hi there, my name is Brooke Taylor. I am a chemistry instructor in the science, math, and engineering department. And I am here to share with you briefly what I did on my sabbatical in fall of 2020 from vine to bottle, the chemistry of wine. I started off my sabbatical taking an online class from um, edX, World of Wine from Grape to Glass. It was offered through uh, by professors in the uh, wine department at the University of Adelaide. I reviewed a couple textbooks, including postmodern winemaking and also a book that was more specific about the chemistry of wine. I interviewed winemakers, some uh, locally, some on Zoom from the Napa Valley, and asked them uh, mostly about their their path that they took to becoming winemakers. I was fortunate uh, two different times to uh, go to the wine foundry in Napa and learn how to blend uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. And then I spent most of my time on uh, the harvest of 2020 working at Benton Lane Winery in the lab. And Benton Lane is in Monroe, just outside of Junction City. Um, so in the lab, uh, most of my time was spent uh, running these three tests on grape samples and wine samples. Um, Bricks measures the sugar concentration and is used to indicate the ripeness of the grapes. Uh, you collect the grapes, crush them in a bag, put them in the fridge overnight, and then take out the juice sample and add some juice here, and you get a reading uh, up here, and we're looking for a value to indicate ripeness of about 24. So this sample had a, had a ways to go. Uh, we would measure TA. This is called stands for titratable acidity using an, a process called titration, which is something we commonly do in our general chemistry labs at Lane. This is an automatic titrator. So the sample, in this case, it's a standard, but the wine sample would go here. And then we have sodium hydroxide is a strong base, is titrated automatically. There's a pH meter and a stirrer, and the uh, computer collects the data, the pH, and creates a titration curve, which kind of looks like a long drawn out S and will then uh, do the calculations for us. And so it gives us a grams per liter of tartaric acid, which is one of the most common acids in both grapes and in wine. Looking for a value kind of five to, to seven grams per liter there. And then we would also test the pH um, using the automatic titrator as well. There's the pH meter. This is, this is a standard. And for wine and, and grape juice, the, the sample will have a pH of somewhere between 3.4 and, and 3.6. So, so pretty acidic, which is why you um, makes you salivate when you when you drink wine. Some of the other tests we would do once the, the grapes, the harvest had been completed and the wine was in the tank or the, was be, was, the juice was in the tank, we would uh, collect samples, label the tanks, um, do some different enzymatic tests. So we would look at some nitrogen levels with two different tests to make sure the yeast had enough nitrogen as nutrients. Uh, we would, when the fermentation was wrapping up and our bricks level had dropped quite a bit, uh, we would run a glucose fructose, fructose test um, in the machine here in the background um, to get a more specific value and to make sure fermentation was complete. We would also run enzymatic tests for malic acid and tartaric acid. Uh, the malic acid changes, the value changes, and it is uh, most red wines undergo malolactic acid fermentation. So we'd want to know that quantity to make sure we added the correct amount of um, malolactic acid uh, fermentation bacteria for that one. In this test here, uh, we were determining the free sulfur dioxide for wine that had been aged in barrels or in tanks. Um, and that measurement would allow us to then, based on also the pH, calculate how much potassium metabisulfite should be added to the wine to maintain that sulfur dioxide level to prohibit microbial growth. And this is why many wines on their label say contain sulfites because of um, the addition of that potassium metabisulfite. And then this test here, this is an ebulometer and it determines the percent alcohol. And that is also needed um, for the wine label. So this would be wine that had already undergone fermentation and had been aged in barrels and was getting ready to be bottled. I was also able to actually make the wine to introduce the yeast. So I measured out the yeast. This is in a large um, like garbage can size, five gallon uh, garbage can. Um, and we would add the yeast. Actually, that's bigger than five gallons, isn't it? We would add the yeast, um, but you can't just dump the yeast in. They would get shocked because the temperature of the tank is so much cooler. So we would have to remove some juice from the tank and add it in to the yeast um, and let it kind of come to temperature. And then once the uh, temperature was um, within 10 degrees of the tank, then we would dump it into the tank. And this is um, one of the uh, kind of overhead views of all the different tanks 
um, at Benton Lane. So in uh, many regards, I was fortunate to be able to be at Benton Lane in 2020 because they picked all of their wine and made, or they picked all their grapes and made wine. We don't quite know what's gonna happen with it yet. Um, so I started working on Tuesday, September 8th. Uh, this was the last time we saw the sun for several weeks. And this was just about an hour later as the smoke rolled in. Um, and requiring going out into the, the vineyard and picking the grape samples for three weeks required uh, a respirator because the smoke was so bad. And this picture really does reflect the color. It, it was that orange on that first day. Um, you can see here the ash on the grapes. Um, and so this was like the worst time for the grapes um, for the smoke, because what happens is the compounds in the smoke get absorbed into the grapes. Pinot Noir grapes have really thin skins. They're very delicate. And so those compounds get into the grapes, the sugars in the grapes bind them. And so if you tasted one of these Pinot Noir grapes, it would taste great. You wouldn't notice anything. But as the wine um, under is made, as, it, as the juice undergoes fermentation, and then as it ages in barrels and as it ages in bottles, those smoke compounds will get released. And so as a result, many vineyards in the Willamette Valley didn't even pick their grapes. So you won't see 2020 uh, Pinot Noir grapes. Yeah, you'll see a lot of rosés because they don't spend very much time on the skin. So that will hopefully minimize those smoke compounds. We also had a downpour on September 18th, which is not good for grapes ripening. So this really uh, caused a lot of havoc for the winemakers. So again, lot, not a lot of 2020 Pinot Noirs. Benton Lane did make it. It's sitting in tanks. They're undergoing a lot of tastings and uh, will determine what they're going to do. So in some sense, I got to experience all of it and learn a whole lot more about smoke. And I will be happy to answer more questions in the Q&A and have uh, more talks with more of the specifics of the chemistry. So have a good rest of your day. Take care. <laughs>